Welcome to the podcast, Let the Prophet Speak. This is Saul Weinreb, the host of your podcast, and today we're going to study Yechezkel, the Navi, that's the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 2. We just finished chapter 1, in which we read about the spectacular vision that Yechezkel had of the chariot of God. We read as his vision progressed, from seeing the angels and describing the spectacular fiery angels that surrounded the chariot of God as they were moving to and fro and traveling. Um, And as he gets closer and closer to the actual, so to speak, throne of God, he was able to see and interpret less and less. More and more he started using language that I saw something like, that it appeared to me as if, and so on and so forth until as he approached a higher and higher level of vision, he could not handle the sights anymore, and he fell flat on his face, paralyzed with, with, with awe and fear. The last verse of, of the chapter, um, of chapter one, stated that he fell on his face, vo'eshma, and these last three words of the previous chapter were vo'eshma, and I heard kol midaber, a voice speaking. These words, Eshma are really crucial to understanding the next chapter, chapter 2. Because at this point, he's, what, what he's basically saying is, and actually, if we look at the beginning of that verse, it says, Cain um, Mar'e, the appearance of the throne of God, of this shine around it. It was similar to appear as if I saw the form. And so on. And then it says, Vo'ere, and I saw, again, seeing, emphasizing over and over again this idea of seeing, but the sights he couldn't see. Vo'epol al and I fell on my face. Vo'eshma, but I was able to hear the voice speaking. This differentiates between the idea of seeing and speaking. And if we think back to the Torah, two verses come to mind. Um, one is the verse... Um, in, in Exodus, Kilo Yirani Ha'adam Bachai, when Moshe, when Moses asked God to see God, in which God says, Adam, a human being, cannot see me and live. So you see that as the sight, a sight, the sight of God, which, which um, is a, a visual perception of something that human beings are incapable of perceiving. However, Shema is the message of the Torah to us, which is most famous from the famous verse, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. That is our mission, is to hear God's message, because we can internalize the message, we can learn it, we can feel it, we can experience it, and we can live it, which is the mission that we have. And we see that, 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 that a lesson here as well. When it was sight, it was a pol al panai, Yechezkel fell upon his face, and couldn't, could not tolerate it. But the voice, the sound, he was able to hear the sound of God's speech. And immediately, again, reminding us of that verse, a person cannot see me, God says to him, this is the voice that he hears, and now we're beginning chapter 2, verse 1, and God says to me, Ben Adam, son of man, Now, literally, it means son of man. Many translations just translate this as mortal being uh, or human being. In other words, differentiating and saying you are human, what you were seeing before was divine. And and, and the only prophet we find that's referred to with this language is Yechazkel, is Ezekiel, who's always reminded that he is a human being. This is not necessarily an insult. At some points we'll find that this is a compliment, some points it's an insult, but it's defining his essence. His essence is that he's a human being, ben adam. And not just a, an adam, but a ben adam, like below adam. It also signifies the, um, the humility of Ezekiel. He's now lying down, face forward. He hears God's voice, but he's not able to whether physically unable to or just mentally unable to get up because he, um, he feels humble before this great sight that he has just seen. So in this case, Ben Adam is also a compliment of his humility. By Omer Eli, Ben Adam, so God says to him, Ben Adam, son of man, Amod al stand up on your feet. 
In other words, just because you're a human being doesn't mean that you can't stand and listen. And I will speak to you. Yes, you cannot see me, but you can hear my message. You can hear my voice. So um, apparently he was still unable to get up because we see in verse 2, a spirit came into me. This presumably sounds like God himself, so to speak, gave him and the, the, gave his body the ability and pushed his body up as God was speaking to me and he stood me up on my feet I was incapable of doing it myself despite God asking me to do it I couldn't do it and God did it for me and then once I was standing on my feet then I heard this is kind of gives us the image that it's not just um Humility is fine, and humility is a wonderful trait, and humility is what God desires from us. But sometimes we have to stand on our feet. And in order to listen to God's message here, uh, Yechezkel, the prophet, needed to also have a little bit of, of, of legitimate and appropriate pride in being the, uh, tapped by God as his prophet. You have to stand up and listen. It's also standing is obviously a sign of respect for the king of kings, God himself. And what did he say to me? What was the message? The message was as follows. This is verse 3. Ben Adam, again, human being. I am sending you, El Bnei Yisrael, to the children of Israel. El Goyim Hamordim Asher Mordubi. To those nations, those rebellious nations that have rebelled against me. The classical commentaries wonder about this term, El Goyim, to those nations, because the entire message seems to be directed to the people of Israel. And in fact, it just said, I'm sending you to the people of Israel. And then it says, to, and to those nations. It doesn't even use the word and. I, I injected the word and. So they say, well, maybe Israel is like several nations because there was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom or the different tribes and so on. However, I, I find that it's really missing the point that really I believe when we ask this question because we find in Jeremiah if we look at uh, chapter 1 verse 10 it also says very clearly Yitir who even though his primary message was to the Jewish people God made it very clearly and used the same language I also sending you to the Goyim to the nations of the world and we find in Jeremiah and we find in Isaiah and we find in many of the prophets that they did not only address the Jewish people, but rather their message was meant to address the other nations as well. And we'll see in the middle section of Ezekiel, he does the same thing. He addresses a message to all the nations. The, the point here is, is that every prophet, while his message, because they are Israelites, and because Israel is the focus of their attention, and the, and the center of all the action here, of course, the primary message is to the Jewish people. But... The, the message learned is not only for the Jewish people, it's for everyone. And that's why it makes it clear, El Goyim Hamordimbi, to all the nations that are rebellious. The Jews aren't the only rebellious nation. There's plenty of other ones, and this message is for them as well. Hema, they, Vavosam, and their forefathers, Pashubi, have rebelled against me, or, or at Etzem Hayomazel, all the way until this day. In other words, despite all the things they've been through, and despite all the lessons I've tried to teach them, down to today, they still are rebellious. Vihabonim, and just like their forefathers acted that way until now, now their children are kishefonim. They are so, um, literally means hard faces, meaning they, they, have, they came to the point where you look in their face and you see they got it all, they know it all, they ain't going to improve. You know, they don't have the humility necessary to change their ways and improve their ways. Their hearts, their insides, their entire personality is such that their strong personality, they refuse to listen to rebuke, they refuse to listen to someone who's trying to teach them better. So therefore, I am sending you to them, and you need to say to them, so says the Lord God, so says God. Now, um, all of the prophets we've had, well, not necessarily all, but the, of the major prophets and many of the minor prophets, we find this call to prophecy. This is the original prophecy where they were first given their, their mission to become prophets, to bring a message to the Jewish people. And this chapter is the, 
is Ezekiel's version, when he was called by God to prophesy. Now, partly because of his personality that we've been learning about, his humble personality, and he's also afraid. We don't find that he responds, that he talks back, but he's listening the entire time. But we can infer from what God tells him what it, exactly it is that was going through his mind and what his hesitations were. And clearly, God is saying, I'm sending you to the people. Um, and he, God acknowledges that, that they aren't the type that are going to listen. So we see in verse 5, Vehema, and they, im yishmu'u im yechtalu, if they listen or if they um, uh, refrain from listening, whether they listen or whether they refrain. A lot of commentators um, point out that in Ezekiel, we, it, this, there seems to be this mood and idea that for the people of Israel that live in Israel, it's over. The decision is already made. It's impossible for them to change. I dispute that understanding. And I think that in this verse, we see that that's not necessarily true. I mean, God makes it clear that he understands that it's basically certain that the people are not going to change their minds or change their ways. However, there is, there is that possibility. In other words, im yishmu, they may listen, im yachtalu, or they may not listen. And uh, they could go either way. Now, the chances are, kives meri heim, I'm continuing the words, because they are a, a group of people that are, are just rebellious. Viyad, and therefore, viyadu, I want them to know, ki navi haya bitocham, there was a prophet among them. They may listen, they may not. But if they don't, and it's very likely that they won't because they are rebellious, at least I want them to know that there was a prophet among them. One way of understanding is this thing that I told you so, and I want to be able to say I told you so, so that later on when they start complaining to me, God says, I can tell them, look, I warned you. That kind, sounds kind of petty and makes God sound kind of petty, so I don't really like that explanation, even though a lot of commentaries use that. But rather, I would say that the point here is is that it's really the opposite. I, they may listen, they may not listen, for they are rebellious people, so they may not listen. But I want them to know that there is a prophet among them telling them the right way, so that they might repent, someone might listen. Even after the punishment, I want them to look back and say, this isn't just some random punishment, this isn't some capricious God that just punishes punishing that thing them randomly, but rather this suffering is happening because of the accumulation of sin and because of their rebelliousness. The only way I know that they'll know that is if a prophet tells them, this is the message, you guys have to get the message. And then at some point, they may learn. That's why it says, Viyadu, I want them to know that there was a prophet among them that warned them of this. The Atta and you, this is verse 6, Ben Adam, you mortal human being, al I do not want you to be afraid of them. Umi divrehem al do not be afraid of their words. From here we see clearly that Ezekiel is worried. The people are not going to listen to me. Umi divrehem, they are going to make fun of me. They are going to abuse me. They are going to so on and so forth. They may even physically harm me, as we see, especially in Jeremiah and, and, and other prophets, where the prophets that tried to bring the people a message were physically harmed or threatened with harm on many occasions because of the message that they were giving that the people did not want to hear. So of course Ezekiel is afraid, but he doesn't say it because remember, we don't hear what Ezekiel says, but we do hear God's response to what he's thinking, which is, which is he's afraid. And God says, don't be afraid. Why? And don't be afraid even when they, um, when they um, push against you their, their, their pointy, sharp uh, thorns and thistles. And it's going to be like you're sitting down upon scorpions, meaning even the places you sit down where you feel comfortable and want to rest, you're going to find that underneath you, those, they're sneaky. They're going to be like sitting on scorpions. They're going to poke you from behind. But do not be afraid of their words. Do not be afraid of their faces. Remember we said that they have hard faces, faces that are stubborn. They're going to give you evil and bad and nasty looks. But don't be afraid. Why? I want you to know there are a bunch of rebellious people. I'm with you. I'm not with them. This is verse 7. And I want you to speak my words to them. Whether they listen or whether they don't listen. 
because they are rebellious, therefore they need to hear this message. Kimuri Hema could be understood as because they are rebellious, therefore they probably won't listen, which is how some commentators read it. I'm reading it, no, because they are rebellious, that's why they need to hear this message, because they need to improve. And they might, they might not. And that's not your problem. Your problem is you have to speak up regardless. Atah, this is verse 8, and you, Ven Adam, you human being, again, Shema, I want you to hear. Here God is speaking to him as a person. This Ben Adam has a lot of meaning. It means he's mortal, it means he's Ben Adam, it means he's a son of mortals, it means he's not, uh, and he, but he's capable of hearing this message, but it also means that he's an individual. What we're going to learn a lot in Ezekiel is the message of the importance of of each person knowing that even if I live in a society which is corrupt around me, I myself can still be good. I myself can improve myself. And this is a message we're going to come back to often in this book. And one of the primary messages of the prophet Ezekiel is if the people won't improve, well, you as an individual can still improve and make yourself better. So God says, Shema, I want you to hear and listen. And again, hear means to internalize the message of God. We may not be able to see him, we may not be able to comprehend God, but we can still hear and listen, his mes listen to his message, which is the message of the Torah. And as we'll see again in Ezekiel throughout the book, that Ezekiel teach, or tries to teach Torah to the people in a very uh, concrete way, much more than any other prophet, because he wants us to shema, he wants us to listen, he wants us to internalize that message. So listen to Esa Sheranim and Daber Eilecha, listen to that which I tell you, Altihi Meri Kibes Meri. You, as an individual, Ezekiel, God says to his prophet, you do not be rebellious like those other people around you that are rebellious. If God is warning him of this, that means that there was a danger that even the great prophet, even Ezekiel, could have fallen into the trap of saying, you know, this is how everyone is, I'm going to be the same like them or get influenced by them. But God says, no, you don't be that way. But rather, I want you, open your mouth, ve'echol, I want you to eat that which I give you. Now what this image of eating, we said hearing. In hearing, we internalize God's message, but then God emphasizes even more, not just internalize it, but eat it and make it part of your being. This is how the Malbim reads this here. And I, I kind of uh, like this explanation, but say, I want you to open your mouth and, 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 and consume it so that it literally becomes part of your entire being physically becomes part of your being. I want you to take this message and make it part of you. Also, when you eat something, it's extremely personal. It's extremely individual. Once you eat something, no one else has that. It becomes a part of you and not a part of anyone else because God is emphasizing that you as an individual at least always have the power to change yourself as an individual. Verse 9, And then I looked. So here he's becoming a person. He's getting... He's, he's getting um, the message of God. He's hearing, he's listening. And all of a sudden he sees again. And I saw, I saw a hand that was sent towards me. So again, I, I caught this glimpse. I caught this vision. This gives us the understanding and the image that once we do hear the message of God, we may never be able to see God himself because that's something that's beyond human capability. But we get glimpses. When we internalize God's message, we get little glimpses. We see little things in the world around us. We every once in a while see a hand reach down and say, uh, and, 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 and give and touch and do. Those are the things that we're supposed to see and perceive. We can't actually see God, but we can see a hand. But only after we internalize his message. Occasionally we'll see a glimpse. There was a hand, and what did I see this hand doing? For in the hand there was a scroll. A scroll symbolizes a message of knowledge. And what is this knowledge God is going to give me? By This is verse 10. God opened the scroll in front of me and said, Here, look, you can read this. This you can see. You can see my message. You can open a Torah. You can open a book. You can open uh, um, uh, 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 a book and read knowledge. There was lots and lots of stuff written on the front and the back of this scroll. What did I read? Kinim vahege vahi. I read uh, kinim or lamentations, crying and, 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 and suffering. I read all of the punishments and things that were coming. So what I saw was not exactly a pleasant vision. 
so uh, uh, we will see in the beginning of verse uh, of chapter three that it's clear God said, here, I'm going to give this to you to eat. I'm going to give you this scroll. I want you to absorb and internalize it. But clearly Ezekiel was revolted by what he saw and did not want to eat. Um, he, he saw this terrible stuff. No, I don't want to make that part of me. I don't want to do it. And God's going to say, no, I want you to eat it anyway, which we're going to see in chapter 3. Thank you so much for studying Ezekiel chapter 2. Looking forward to studying chapter 3 together and, of course, the entire book of Ezekiel. Thank you.